time now. Okay, cool. Thanks, thanks everybody. Um, good evening, good morning to people across the globe who've joined in. Um, um, thanks for taking the time out and um, attending the session. Um, I have noted the couple of questions that have come through in the chat box while we were waiting for more people to turn up. I see in the audience some of my um, old colleagues as well, and a couple of my friends. So thanks a lot for joining in, folks. Um, what I'm trying to do now is uh, I'm going to uh, start sharing my screen, uh, my presentation, and walk you through. The context is this, right? Um, we, uh, I'm part of Tech Mahindra as a company, and I lead the design thinking consulting practice here. Uh, we use design thinking to help organizations address a range of problems, um, be it from process redesign or uh, be it um, uh, rewriting an application's requirements, redesigning an application or reimagining a process, um, taking technology decisions, developing a customer experience strategy, any which area that requires digital transformation or a key initiative sees a value in design thinking coming into play. <clears throat> now, why it comes into play is because of many reasons. Uh, first and foremost is because it, it sets aside or postpones the solution design till you've actually nailed down what is the problem you're trying to solve. Why should we do it? Asking the why five times before you get to an answer. And that in our experience has helped us realize that projects become more successful because we do that, right? Um, for example, all of us in our careers would have experienced projects where, um, I will present my slides in a bit. Um, I'm just setting the context to start with. We, we've come across situations where projects either don't go successful after meeting all the testing requirements. Um, all the requirements written by in the business requirement phase have been met. Um, use cases have been passed yet people don't adopt it. Yet you have change requests coming in for plugging in gaps. These are classical problems where the return on investment in your project is questionable because you thought you've done it to the dot, but then it's not been successful. Those are examples or symptoms of a problem which is deeper, and that's why design thinking helps you. Um, having said that, let me quickly go around to sharing my screen um, and walk you through the presentation, yeah. So, um, can you see my presentation on screen now? Yes, we can see. Yes. Now. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. So, um, this is on uh, a, briefly a design thinking workshop focused on how do you identify the right problem and then build the right solution for the problem. That's what we're trying to do. Okay. Um, in the next hour, I'll try to quickly run you through the key parts of empathy definition of the problem and ideation and uh, walk you through some tips and tricks and some examples and wrap it up with a case study as well as a couple of diverse scenarios in which design thinking can be used. And then we take your questions uh, in the last 15 minutes, but you can keep sending the questions in through chat, but I'll be looking at it once we get towards the end of it. So uh, we will focus on why uh, design thinking is useful and how do we transition from theory of what design thinking is to the reality of implementing it in, in a real world. Um, some of the expectations people had from this I saw in the chat was how is it different from agility? How can it help a soft skills facilitator? Um, and updated guidelines. I didn't get the last part on updated guidelines, but then I would try to share with you what's the what is design thinking all about? And therefore, it will explain to you, it's not just about agility, but it's about accuracy as well. And um, uh, in terms of how can it help soft skills facilitators, you'll find the answer as we go through for sure. And in terms of updated guidelines, I could probably talk to you about updated practices that we follow having done design thinking over the months and years. So over multiple uh, tens and twenties of projects that you could probably get some of those tips and tricks that you can implement. Now, I'd like to ask uh, people to look at this slide and uh, drop your messages in chat. My question to you is this. Um, which of the birds in this picture, in this slide that you see, are digitally touched up and uh, artificial? That's my question to you. 
you see an image, uh, a collection of images here, which are nine in number. Um, which of these do you believe are natural and which of them are, or at least give me a count of how many of these do you believe are artificially modified? Right, I'll give you a minute. And please uh, send in your responses on chat. Four, okay, I got one response in. All are modified, okay. All, okay. All, okay. All, 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 okay. Right, so basically, let me rephrase my question. How many of these do you believe are natural? How many of these do you believe are artificial? So when you say all, I presume you're saying all of these are artificial, right? When I say digitally modified, it means they're not existing in reality. They have been modified to appear differently, okay? Okay, okay. And the digital modification is not just for clarity of the image and blurring of the background and stuff, but actually modified, okay? Only one was digitally modified. Jure, that's a bold statement. Okay, which one do you believe that it is, Jure? One last part one is modified. Okay, cool. Now let me let me bust the myth and let me disappoint you all. None of these are digitally modified. All of them are natural birds that exist in reality. And you'd realize by now that I'm, I'm a fan of wildlife and that's the reason I picked this up. As I struggled to communicate the message of design thinking to my clients, I came upon this approach and I put the slide together. <clears throat> These are examples of birds with some of the most weird and unseemly beaks in the world. But all of these are real birds. How long they will be in the, in the world and when they will go extinct is anybody's guess, but they are all existing and thriving as of today. This on the left extreme is a rhinoceros hornbill. This of course is a flamingo. This is a shoebill. This is a crossbill. Now this is to me the most weird looking bird because the beak of this looks so twisted that you would actually think it's a deformity. You'd actually think that nobody could think of designing a beak of this nature because how could it even work? when it's twisted like that, right? This bird is a swordbilled hummingbird, one of 300 species of hummingbirds. The beak is longer than its body. And it can only sit with its beak pointed out because otherwise it will fall down because of the center of gravity. It can't turn its beak and preen its own feathers like every bird does because the beak is just too long. But it is able to thrive in an environment where only a bird with this kind of a beak is able to access nectar from a flower which grows in that environment, which has a very long stem, which it can only access with this kind of a beak. It can't bore through, it can't do anything else. It needs a beak of this length. This crossbill is specialized in being able to pry open the pine cone to be able to get to the nuts within it. And that is the reason that this bill is built that way. And it has access to a food source that many others just cannot get access to. This is a puffin, which stacks up fishes in its beak like this. This is a, this is a mud skipper. This is an American skimmer, which has a, a lower mandible, which is longer than the upper mandible. And it flies over the water body with its lower beak inside the water. And the moment it touches a edible product, it just snaps shut, flies up, swallows it. That's the purpose of the beak being longer in the bottom so that the top beak is above and it's just able to snap shut easily. And this is of course a, sh um, a spoon bill, uh, which is able to tap, tap into the food that way. So the message I'm trying to convey through this is if you were given a task of designing a beak, none of us would have thought of coming up with a beak of any of these shapes because to us, this would have just looked absurd, impossible, wrong, um, uh, unacceptable. But this is exactly the kind of beak that this bird requires for the environment that it lives in to compete with the people that it has to compete with and to leverage the resources that it has access to. Similarly, each of the birds here, 
So the message in the slide is unless you pause to understand who is your user, what are the problems they are faced with? What are the available resources that they have to work with? What are the environment that they have to exist in and thrive in? What is the competition that they have? Who are the other stakeholders involved? What kind of constraints are imposed? Only when you do all of that and identify the real problem will you then come up with a solution that satisfies the problem and benefits the user. So this is an example from nature of the essence of design thinking, that you pass to div you design a solution only after you've empathized enough with the context of what you're trying to solve. Then you will identify the right problem and then you'll identify the solution. Did this, um, did this give you a good understanding of the value of design thinking in terms of busting a couple of myths? Brilliant, okay, thank you. Right, so what I would like to go and show you next is now that we've looked at an example of how some of the solutions which you'd have thought about originally and discarded and rejected upright, uh, upfront may actually have been the right solution to go after. And the reason we discarded it is because we had prejudiced expectations of what we think a solution has to contain. Unless we bust that myth and tune our thinking design our thinking to be able to look at it from the point of view of empathy, define the problem, and then ideate, your solutions are bound to be fraught with the risk of not being successful. That's the message that we come up with. Now, uh, design thinking adds a lot of value because one, once you've, Im you've immersed yourself into the context of the user, understood the environment they are in, looked at the multiple stakeholders involved, you have already ensured stakeholder alignment in understanding and empathizing with them and coming to a definition of the problem that you're trying to solve. So your stakeholder alignment automatically improves. Because you've spent the time aligning the stakeholders, getting them to a common vision, getting them to a common purpose, understanding the pains which are the primary pains across the group to address, the ROI of any such investment behind projects become much better than otherwise. And because you're looking at it from an overall stakeholder point of view, the experience of every customer, be it internal or external, gets enhanced because rather than doing a pointed laser surgery, you're doing a master health checkup and then a gamut of op activities to improve the overall stakeholder's expectations. And therefore, customer experience improves. Change management is easier because you've already done stakeholder alignment. What more do you want? Change management becomes that much more easier because everybody sees their problem and sees the solution in what you're building. And therefore the risk is minimized and efficiency improves. This is the value of doing design thinking, okay? Uh, now this is a slide that I picked up because this, um, the, the IDEO group is perhaps the best representative of design thinking, and they are the ones who are the gurus of design thinking. And this is the CEO, Tim Brown, who said, design thinking is a human-centered approach to innovation that draws from not just the designer's toolkit to integrate the needs of people, but it also looks at the possibilities of technology and the requirements of business success. In very simple terms, what he says is desirability, viability, and feasibility. If you look at it, three intersecting circles, that's what this does. Design thinking ensures that the intersection of those three are effectively managed, and therefore the projects or the ideas that fall in that intersecting space between the three circles become the ones that are built further upon and therefore successful. The focus of design thinking is predominantly to start with the desirability element. The technical feasibility and the viability come in afterwards because once you've defined the problem, desirability addressed, ideas are out on table, then you prototype them and the feasibility and everything else comes into play. Uh, Ramakrishna, if you don't mind, can you share the yeah. screen? I don't think you're sharing the screen now. Oh, Thank really? You. Sorry. Apologies, that went away. Is it visible now? Um, you are seeing the PowerPoint, not the PowerPoint uh, slideshow. Okay.
Is that okay now? Yes, thank you. Great, thanks for pointing out. Where did you lose me last? Uh, was this you were talking okay? about the three circles um, okay. of alignment? It, it, this slide was okay. You got to see this one. Nope, we can see that. Oof. Oh, okay. So this is basically what I was saying that because design thinking ensures stakeholder alignment by empathizing with all concerned stakeholders, um, the change management becomes easier and the return on investment is better because everybody finds their problem being factored in and their ideas being incorporated in the solution. And therefore, both change management and ROI becomes better. Customer experience improves as a result of that. Risk goes down and efficiency improves because all of these are taken care of in terms of change management and stakeholder alignment and customer experience. These two fall into place. Then I was showing you this slide, which basically says the definition of Tim Brown's uh, definition of what design thinking is. And I said you could visualize this in terms of an intersection of three circles. Um, three sets, which is desirability, viability, and feasibility. The intersection of the three of them becomes the most viable project that gets picked, up, picked upon. And um, design thinking focuses more on desirability to start with, because that's where the, the, the seed of the idea forms. And those desirable items are what then get evaluated for viability and feasibility. And then those that fall into that intersection gets built into successful projects. Now, um, this is another, um, this is, all of you would have seen this, the classical five steps of design thinking, which is empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. Now, the image on the left is another um, um, example from nature. This is uh, perhaps the only creature in the world which has a transparent head. The rest of the body isn't, only the head is. And uh, it's called a barrel fish, and it's in the deeps of the ocean. Now, um, this came in BBC Earth recently. Um, if you look at it, the eyes are actually those two green things that you see on top, and it keeps looking up. And then the other two things which look to be the eyes are actually the nostrils kind of thing. So these are the eyes. Now, if only it was that simple to actually look into the mind or into the head of a human to see what's going on, uh, which is not practical and not possible in the case of humans, we have this design thinking framework, which is empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. These are typically those five steps that all design thinking processes go through. The important thing, uh, in case you're not familiar with this, is that um, while these are necessarily the flow that needs to go through, you often go back to validating your empathy each time you cross this process. So it's not like you finish this and gone to the next and you never go back to this. It's kind of iterative. So as you define the problem, you start, um, you know, you, you improve upon the empathy that you've already got. As you start ideating, you start crystallizing and slightly fine tuning the definition of the problem that you've arrived at. Uh, and then the prototype and test happens. So unless you spend enough time and empathize, um, and define and ideate, uh, the prototype and test doesn't really help because um, you've probably missed the buzz already here. So question to all of you, if you were to choose between these five, while all of them look of similar size, which do you think is the most important in terms of you better get it right at this stage? What might be that one, one of these five which you think is the most important to get right? Discover, define, empathize. Okay, any more? Prototype, ideate, okay. Cool. Prototype, okay, cool. Ideate, right. Um, the, the truth is, unless you've empathized well enough with your stakeholders, to identify what they go through, who you know created the persona map, the journey map, understood the pains that they go through, you wouldn't be able to define the problem that you need to solve. And unless you define the right problem to solve, you will be building a wrong solution, right? Um, and and therefore the ideation will only be as good as a, as good as the definition of the problem and the accuracy of the definition of the problem. The accuracy of the definition of problem is strongly dependent on the ability to empathize well and set aside prejudices and set aside preconceived notions 
and be able to engage the right kind of stakeholders to the optimal extent. Unless you do that, you don't define the right problems. Unless you define the right problems, you don't ideate for the right problems. And therefore, your prototype and test may not be, even if you do a fundamentally brilliant prototype and test it very well, you might still come up with a project at the end of the test, which a product at the end of the test, which wouldn't be really solving your core user issue because you failed at the empathize phase. So um, if you were to ask me in terms of if you had to make a choice, then I would say empathize is the area where you have to spend the most diligent focus because unless you empathize well enough, down the line, you're in building risk into the project as you go down the phases and the cost of quality or cost of correction becomes very high. And um, of course, it doesn't help if you just empathize well and define well, but you don't come up with good ideas, right? So you can always argue saying that even if you do good empathize and define, unless you ideate, the desirability doesn't get addressed and therefore the viability and feasibility go, go for a toss. I agree. But then um, all of it starts with empathy. And unless you empathize well enough, assuming you do a good job of everything, unless you focus maximum efforts and empathize, you're setting the entire project up for failure. So I would place my bets if I was a poker player on empathize. Now, um, how are we doing on time? We are half an hour through the session. Okay, so um, what I'd show in the next few slides is basically what are the key steps in design thinking? I'll focus mainly on only the empathize, define and ideate because this topic was on how do you build the right solutions for the right problem, right? So therefore we need to identify how to define the right problem and then how to come up with the right solutions for the problem. And therefore, I'm going to focus more on empathize, define, and ideate in this webinar. And um, for, in the interest of time, leave the prototype and test out because these are the core things as per the agenda that I'd uh, set up in the video. So now let me talk to you about empathize, right? Um, of course, there's a difference between empathy and sympathy. Everybody would know that. Um, now, the, in one line, if I was to say what's empathy, it would be to say, I need to be able to sweat and fret the way you do. I need to be able to feel the aches and pains just the way that you do. Because only then will I really be in your shoes. Otherwise, I'd only be saying that I'm in your shoes, but I don't really live your problem. But the catch here is if I live too much in your problem and I get too close to your way of thinking, then it becomes like the Stockholm syndrome, right? But I, I start loving my captors so much that I don't want to get rescued. So I start loving to be in the same scenario rather than look for change. So it's important to feel your aches and pains, sweat and fret the way you do. Only then do I really understand where you're coming from. And unless I understand where you're coming from, I can't say that I've started even empathizing with you. There are various things you can do to do the empathy well. Um, we do something called imprinting where we go on the ground, we meet people, we observe things, we are on the floor if it's an IT context or a shop flow context, um, or we go into the retail outlet and sit with people and observe the interaction. So those kind of things become some of the elements of empathy, but that's not all of it. It's not just being there and looking at things. It's also asking the right questions, doing some scientific approaches to how you build the empathy. So here are a couple of, uh, it's a highly condensed uh, presentation, just to give you an idea of what, it, what goes into this. So, some of the steps in design thinking are, the idea is to be able to see it as your stakeholders do. Only then can you say that you've empathized. That's the point, right? Now, seeing it as they do doesn't mean thinking of it and solving it as they do, because you bring in your expertise as a design thinker to come up with solutions and definitions of the problem. So it's important to start with some anchor problem statement, because as you start trying to figure out what the real problem is, you need to start with some you know, tent pole in the ground and then you start building your tent around it. So you start with a problem definition version 1.0. And then you need to look at who are the stakeholders that you're working with. You need to do a stakeholder mapping. Uh, there are various templates. If you Google up, you'll find stakeholder mapping templates. Stakeholders are mapped in terms of um, you know, uh, core to the problem, influencers, cannot influence. That's one way to look at it actors, enforcers, um, controllers. There are different ways in which you can map stakeholders. 
but it's important to map the stakeholders so you know who all are the different groups of stakeholders you need to empathize with. Then it's important to now form a hypothesis given the problem definition that you've done and then seek to validate that hypothesis. It could be a set of hypotheses. You need to seek to validate each of those hypothesis sets through effective research. And before you do user research, you need to do planning for the user research because invariably the biggest problem is you do use the research, but you do not go about, um, you, you, you're prejudiced to try and find a conformity bias because you have a feeling of what the problem is. You stop your research the moment you start hearing feedback that conforms to what you already have in mind. And to avoid that bias, conformity bias in user research, it's important to have a research planning designed up front and laid out so that that gets followed thereon. Then you do user research, and then there are some templates that we can use for it. So what you see in the right half of the screen is an example of a problem definition. It starts with something like um, at present, and then you describe the context. Uh, this is what is happening. Therefore, how might we do something, which is the change that you expect? For whom are you doing this? Therefore, who are all these users who will be impacted by this? Why do you want to do it so that? And then you describe the goal. So you actually form the problem statement definition version one in this format. At present, blah, blah, how might we dash for dash so that dash. And then you build the rest of it. This acknowledgedly is going to change as your empathy improves through the process of your user research. And some of the artifacts that you develop as part of this entire empathy is um, uh, you, you do a lot of deliverables. I will show you what the deliverables are in the next slide. But the other important part in the entire process is the research planning. And that's why I wanted to show you this slide. Now, in research planning, there are different types of research you can do. You can do interviews. Obviously, everybody knows that. Surveys, Survey Monkey, everybody knows you can do surveys. Uh, again, there are so many different tips and tricks that you need to remember when you structure an interview and structure a survey in terms of the number of questions you can ask, the number of options you need to give, the number of open-ended questions, close-ended questions, leading questions that you need to have. Uh, it, there is a science to how you structure an interview as well as a survey. Then you have focus group meetings, you have mystery shoppers, you have pure data analysis, which gives you a lot of insights from research more than, you know, they say data talks, right? Rather than having to talk to people, you can even look at data in addition to all of this. You could do just Google search. Um, you could do shadowing of people who are doing the work. So you understand uh, from a practical observance point of view of the research happens. You can do, in IT context, you can do logs analysis. Um, you can also do just get out of the building and meet people, observe things and talk to people in random. And that is another way of research that you can choose. So which of these you want to use, you can choose and have. But certainly any research in design thinking cannot be purely offline, which is basically send a survey, get a response, or shoot out an interview questionnaire, get a response, and you're done with your research. It can never happen that way. It needs to have in-person conversation, be it virtual or physical in person. And then you typically have this kind of a table you create. What's the purpose of the research? What is the mode of research you're going to use, which is one of these elements on the left? What is the sample size you want to look at for that mode of research and that purpose? Who is the target segment you'll be looking at, again, from your stakeholder mapping that you would identify? And then you put this table together. And, and then you start the research, because then you're forced to go down and tick every element in every row in this table, because otherwise you'd stop short with only one the moment you start hearing conformity or you believe you've heard feedback, which is predominantly weighed on one line. And therefore to avoid that kind of um, skewed insights that come through, you need to formulate a research approach this way. Uh, and one of the key things that Stephen Covey says is most people do not listen with the intent to understand, they listen with the intent to reply. And that's a key thing that uh, as a researcher, um, you need to be aware of both in the way you conduct an interview as well as the way you interpret the response when it comes back from a user, right? And the two key principles in research that we need to keep in mind is that it's their perspective is what is more important than your own perspective as a researcher. 
because the whole point of doing a research is to understand from their perspective. And it's important to share bright spots um, in addition to pain areas, not just the pain areas. Bright spots are basically things that work well. So when you conduct the interview, it's also important to say, okay, tell me what's working well. What do you like about what exists today? Because you don't want to disrupt what's going well in the interest of wanting to change things or introduce an improvement. So it's important to strengthen what's working well as well as correct what's not working well. And uh, the image that you see in the bottom is a interesting real story where there were two friends. Um, one person was blind and used to always ask the other person that, um, um, what is the time? What is the time every now and then? And the other person who had eyesight used to always tell him the time. So one day he decided to make life easier for his friend and he designed a watch using Lego which had um, enough kind of um, ability that the blind person could feel and figure out the time on his own. And uh, he gifted that to his friend and the friend wore it and he was, the, fr the, the, the blind person received the gift and the person who had eyesight who gifted it was beaming with pride, waiting to hear, thanks a ton is really good. So the other person said, okay, what is this? Okay, so you can find time on your own, you can figure out, I've built it in such a way that you don't have to depend on anybody. Um, and you'd be surprised that the response that he got from the uh, blind person was great uh, that he took the interest to do this for me, but that basically advertises and makes it that much more tangible that I'm a person hard of seeing. And I feel more um, bracketed in that sense. So as a person who is blind, I would like not to be that obviously visible and I'd like it to be that much more subtle. And therefore, if you had designed something which is less obvious as built for a blind person, I would have been more happy. So um, that's an example of how a project has gone through to a conclusion uh, without considering the mindset or the expectations of the key user in terms of how they'll interpret it rather than um, you know, looking at it from what it helps it also is important to look at what it shouldn't look like. And that's uh, another point that research will help you identify when you do the right kind of questions to build those insights as to what pitfalls you need to avoid when you devise a solution from a user's perspective. All right, and some of the outcomes of a typical empathy project, and I just sh sharing some of the uh, outcomes we typically do is, one is you create a persona map, which is what you see in the left top. And there are tons of examples of persona maps in the, in the web that you can Google up. And there are software tools available, paid software, free software that can create persona maps for you. You basically try to identify what's the role, the goal, the what delights the person, what frustrates the person, uh, who are the, what's the sphere of influence the person has and who are the other actors in that place. This is a kind of an actor map or a stakeholder mapping. Who, it, who he controls, who he influences, who he can't control, and what are the expectations a person has from that role. So there are various ways in which you can build a persona map. And then after you build the persona map, um, you're able to relate to the persona and create a journey map for the different journeys that the person engages in. And again, there are tons of examples of templates and journey maps. Um, this is just one sample of it. And uh, it basically charts the journey of the person and the difference between a journey map and a process map is that a journey map looks at it from an experience and e emotion point of view rather than just a process step, right? It, it talks about fundamentally the axis, Y axis talks about the dipping experience level or the improving experience level in terms of happiness and engaging in the journey of the person that you're building this journey map for. It looks at different tools and systems that are being used, the trigger points of pains that happen. The pains are mapped here in the bottom at each step of the journey and what trigger causes. So um, this journey map gives you a much more focused microscopic view of pains at every step of the journey. And then you can use this as a fundamental to figure out how to shorten the journey, um, improve the journey's experience, remove the steps, um, automate the steps, um, remove the multiple tool dependencies. There are many things that you can do with this, but this gives you a fundamental insight into the pains that the people go through. And we also look at what are the bright spots and then we map it against uh, some kind of bucketing of those bright spots to say what people are very happy about today. 
right? This is an example of how you have identified through empathy the different personas, created journey maps for them, identified what works well, identified the pain areas. Now you have the recipe in place to actually start cooking up what the definition of the problem really is and what needs to be done to solve it. Um, are we okay so far? Okay. Yeah, the, the, the sample output was um, kept a little unclear because these are actually examples of what we've done elsewhere. So you can actually look it up in the Google anywhere. You'll find some examples of these templates. Just look for persona maps and journey maps. You'll find tons of it, tons of examples. Um, Yep, stakeholder mapping, yes, it's one of the first things that we engage in. However, um, the, the, pur the purpose you do stakeholder mapping while engaging a new client and the purpose you do stakeholder mapping when you're commencing a new project will be slightly different because sometimes when you engage with in a project, you might the project sponsor might not even consider some of the stakeholders internally as people you need to empathize with. And unless you empathize with them, your project is not going to be successful because those groups will not empathize employ your project at the end of it. And therefore, it, the, the way you might do the identification might be slightly different. So in any project, you say, the project manager might say, okay, you need to talk to A, B, C, D, E. Only when you've commenced the project initial stages, you'll realize there's an F and G and H as well. And then you add on to the list and it's important to do it uh, that sense. Now, uh, for a client, new client who can help in stakeholder mapping. Now the stakeholder mapping, if you leave it to the client to identify who the stakeholder should be, you're setting yourself up for failure because they are prejudiced because they have used to being in the problem. They only, the loudest voice, the, the baby that cries the loudest gets hurt the most. So they might not even consider certain groups. For example, we were redesigning a Siebel CRM account summary screen. And the objective was how can design thinking help me make this account summary screen and Siebel CRM much better? we landed up identifying 10 different stakeholder groups to empathize with. And that happened because the customer identified six initially. We identified there are four more when we actually got around to doing this research and we understood this is how it is used. These are the different people using. We put a stakeholder map in place. We looked at the different groups involved and asked the questions, where does this output go? Who does this go to? What do they use it for, et cetera? Then we identified more people. So the jump start is given by them. The spark plug comes from them. The building up comes from you as a consultant. Yep, okay. So I think we've looked at the questions that have come in. Right, now I'll go back to my presentation. Yeah. Now we look at uh, defining the problem, which is the second of the three pieces that I wanted to focus on. Um, now, um, in Defining the problem, um, the key three parts to the defining of the problem is you need to have a vision statement that's very clear. Um, and that vision statement has to be bought into by all the stakeholders concerned that you've already mapped in the empathy phase. And everybody that you've engaged with in the empathy should be through with you till the testing phase. You can't engage with a group for empathy, a separate group for definition, separate for ideation, or say, Okay, now that I've empathized with you, I will come back and tell you what your problem is and what the ideas are. It doesn't work that way. It has to be connected. So uh, you need to have the vision statement uh, done from everybody. And you need to get people moving from thinking of what's my pain to what is our collective pain. So moving from my pain to our pain is one of the key steps that you do in design uh, definition of the problem phase in design thinking. And then you redefine the problem statement on the basis of having done these three successfully. So uh, what's the real problem to solve? A good problem statement. One, these are three, three main things that you need to remember. One, a good problem statement has to be concrete. Um, it, it has to actually be tangible. It ha actually has to be in crystal clear terms and not very wishy-washy. Um, it has to have an emotional appeal because that's when people identify with it rather than it being purely numerical in terms. It needs to be able to inspire imagination, right? Um, a beautiful example of a inspiring imagination is your problem statement should not be a noun-based problem statement. Your problem statement should have a noun and a verb mix in it, or at least certainly a verb should be there. 
right? Um, think about it uh, and ruminate on it. You will get the message behind it. Um, for example, if you say, I want to design, I want to redesign my CXO dashboard. Then you're actually saying redesign. Okay, that's a verb. But then CXO dashboard, it becomes a noun. So you're defining your problem statement or your vision statement or your project objective in terms of a noun, CXO dashboard, right? Suppose you make it a different way. I want to enable quicker decision making by redesigning my CXO dashboard. Then your focus of this problem definition flips to quicker decision making rather than CXO dashboard. CXO dashboard becomes a vehicle through which the objective of quicker decision making is achieved. So in all situations, the moment you define a problem statement in a noun and verb form, you're able to inspire imagination. Now, when you say quicker decision making, it opens up more opportunities to think about how can it be made quicker? How can you enable decision making? You might think of new elements that are missing in the dashboard that needs to come in. You might think of um, reprioritizing the way an in input is projected in the dashboard. There are many things that might come into mind. But if it's purely just redesign the dashboard, then you're limiting yourself to playing around with imagination to what you can do. There are three ways to define a problem statement. It could be a min-max. How do I minimize this or how do I maximize that? Um, it could be a metaphor. So you can say, I'd like to be the Uber of, um, of um, IT support. Um, or it could be an emotional experience. How do I be the go-to person um, that makes somebody feel at, at home uh, when they check into my hotel, something like that. So the emotional experience could be one way of framing using a metaphor approach or a min-max approach could be the other way of framing a problem statement. Um, and um, one of the ways to revisit the problem definition that you've done upfront, once you've done the empathy phase is to do the docking exercise, which is basically where you choose what kind of problem, may, you know, ask people to put dots or vote on different problem statements that you've come up with so that you have a collective representation of which ones become more important to address in the eyes of the stakeholders whom you've engaged. And it's important to realize and remember that you don't need to solve all problems. If you solve 80%, if you solve 20% of the problems that cause 80% of the pain, then you've done it. You don't need to solve 100% of the problems. So 80-20 Pareto rule is important to keep in mind here because the effort you take to fix all problems may not be worthwhile because the returns you get from it may not be commensurate with the effort that you put in. So these are the three dictums. How do you word the problem statement, the three ways in which you frame it, and then the um, fact that you have to not solve all problems and engage everybody when you define the problem and redefine the problem. So then you condense it finally to say, how might we do this for this group so that this outcome is achieved? And this then becomes your problem definition that you go with. And this already imbibes the vision in it because the vision is coming through in the so that bit, right? So all of the elements that we've talked about be the vision statement, my pain to our pain, condenses itself in the way the redefined problem statement takes shape. Some of the ways in which we do that is in some exercises, we've had customers walk up to the board one by one and write what their team would define as, why are we doing this? What's the vision of this project? What's the purpose of doing this? And we get people to write it. And then we then all of us collectively analyze everything that they've written. And then we identify which ones resonate best and therefore coin a vision statement that picks elements from all as much as possible that makes sense. So that everybody finds themselves reflecting or their feelings reflecting in the vision statement. And then we do an affinity mapping, and then we get people to come and vote against the problem statements so that we know uh, which problem statements has the maximum number of votes from people. And therefore, the 126 odd problems, problem chits that we had recorded earlier were condensed into these seven different problem areas. And then on the basis of the voting, the top four problem areas with these four areas, collaboration and communication, product management, process limitation, system limitation. So then you know that solving these four or these three take care of the bulk of your challenges 
And you probably can defer working on these other three for later. And, and this is representative of what the group wants as well. So then you've ensured stakeholder alignment, the ROI is gonna be better, risk is lower, et cetera, et cetera. Although you might have some people saying, oh, this got missed out, but then they're collectively bought into this process and they've collectively recognized that this is how we worked it and this is therefore what we'll be solving. So this is one way of doing this. And then we move on to ideation so far. Um, any questions so far on problem definition from anybody? No. Okay. I want to take quicker decisions. I want to be able to make quicker decisions is a wish list. Uh, it is, uh, the problem is I'm not able to make decisions quickly, right? Um, and therefore solving it is the solution where you're enabling the people to be able to come up with uh, tools or mechanisms that will help them um, enable the quicker decision-making becomes a solution. So yeah, so it's different from from actually the problem statement. Now here is an example of uh, ideation or, or the couple of slides in ideation. So this is perhaps the only double Nobel Prize winner. His name is Linus Pauling. And he says the best way to get a good idea is to have a lot of ideas. So um, you'd be surprised, but basically what he's saying is the quantity of ideas helps you ensure the quality of the idea that comes up. So a bias towards quantum is what um, is coming through in this. And the objective of the ideation here is that it should be a collective ideation so that uh, parts of ideas that come from different people pooled together gives you collective ownership. And therefore collective ideation helps in collective ownership. Um, the important formula here is one plus one can equal three because you're actually mixing ideas to come up with something much, much better than each of them individually. Um, it's important to remember to flare and not just focus on one particular area. So therefore, when it comes to ideation, it's important to flare here. So as when in, in empathy, you flare, and then in definition, definition, you again focus and come down and you narrow down to a single definition. And then you flat up again when you get down to ideation and prototyping, and then you narrow it down again, focus down again when you're going down to testing. So that's the typical cyclical approach that happens. Uh, it's important to defer the judgment on an idea and not reject an idea up front. And therefore, to not reject an idea up front, we typically do not ask people to voice their ideas, but instead post their ideas so that people don't have the hesitancy that somebody might shoot it down. It's important to have a time-bound exercise that ensures you're able to get the ideas that you need on time. It needs to have a number goal saying, okay, I need thousand ideas to come out of this half an hour session, right? So you, you park a number and have a goal and challenge people to come up with ideas for the heck of it just to meet that goal as well. Uh, and then you need to have a bias for quantity and then the quality will come up on its own. And you need to design for the extreme scenarios rather than just for the commonplace scenarios. That's when you're... Um, when you think of ideation, you come up with some vacuo ideas. Um, and, and the fundamental belief is you really don't need a bathtub to have a eureka moment. You can actually engineer a eureka moment. And um, um, there are various ways in which you do ideation. Of course, individual brainstorming is something everybody does. You could do three minute ideations and you could do a two minute restart at the end of it. Then you do some sketching based ideation without words. Then you do a process people, product-based ideation, technology-based ideation, or how do you use information-based levers for ideation and come up with uh, rounds of ideation focused only on these. You could look at value chain-based ideation saying, how can you now look at this element of the value chain and come up with ideas for this, given the problem statement that we're trying to solve. Look at maximum, how can you look at maximizing something or minimizing something as a fulcrum on which you're coming up with ideas, how can you eliminate, combine, divide, or automate uh, things and then come up with ideas specifically on all of those? 
these are different ways in which you can drive the number goal um, by running ideation across some of these. So uh, all of this leads up to giving you a ton of ideas. And then you start bucketing the ideas into groups, just like you did in problem definition. And then you start voting for it. There is an ideation card. There are many templates available for it. You can look at that for ideation. And from there on, you could then pick up the best ideas. You vote for them, evaluate them, have people buying into it. And you pick up a basket of a shortlisted set of ideas, which you then prototype. So some of the sample outputs of the, uh, of the ideation exercises, you basically have different ideas coming up against each of the panes that people had already written down. Um, you categorize the ideas across the different categories. So the tons of ideas that you've got um, in all these exercises, you kind of bucket it against individual categories. Once you've categorized them, um, you also look at how those ideas will help you get from a journey map or from an assist to a 2B, and then how the 2B journey map itself looks. So you remember the journey map you created in definition phase and empathy phase? You then create a 2B journey map at the end of it because now in the earlier phase, you done the assets, you identified the pains, now you've gone the recipe for what needs to be done to fix those pains, and therefore you chart a 2B journey map. The building blocks that you have in between here are the ones that will help you get from this for this particular journey from the assets to the 2B. And those building blocks become the product backlog here. And you come up with an outcome that says, here are the items that you need to put into play to deliver these kind of benefits um, as envisaged to the journey mapping. And then the ways you build a product backlog are umpteen. Um, you can tag it to a pain area. You can tag it to a benefit. You can tag it to a, um, a persona. You can tag it to a user role. You can tag it to a must have or a should have or a could have. And then you actually write the, the user story narration itself here. And um, you build your um, solution or uh, on that basis, you say the MVP is therefore carved out from here. And that's how you take the entire project through from an ideation, empathy, to a definition, to an ideation. And then this carries on to deliverables of prototyping and testing thereafter. Now, in Tech Mahindra, we've used design thinking in many different areas across digital strategy, digital customer operations or future enterprise. So we worked with large uh, railroad operators who wanted to modernize their IT. Uh, which is running their core transportation systems. But that challenge was not what technology to go to, but their problem was how do I build a business case that helps me bring about change that business wants and what does business want? That was a key ask. And therefore I built my business case around enabling that change of business expectations. And then the technology that supports it falls into place. We worked with a large IT services provider, which wanted to implement SAP S4 HANA, but then not just implement HANA, but use that as an opportunity while you're changing platform from Oracle to SAP to also look at what process changes need to be coming in so that the entire experience for the users, as well as the people in the finance team becomes better and use that process of what S4 HANA can do plus the Delta so that collectively the end outcome is satisfactory to everybody concerned. We worked with a large uh, pharma major to help them improve their breast cancer support program in India, where um, uh, they have a patient support program for breast cancer patients and for a lot of um, critical illness patients. And breast cancer was one pilot project where we said, uh, let's look at what we need to do to be more patient centric. And then came up with a lot of insights that helped them redesign how the patient support program itself works across digital enablement to logistics, to alerts, to patient engagement, to ecosystem collaboration, all of it. Uh, we worked with um, a large healthcare analytics firm over multiple projects from redefining their digital strategy to their process redesign, um, to uh, being able to create um, better uh, de-risking methodologies for their um, person dependent processes uh, we worked with the logistics major in USA to help them build a business platform to enable Forex growth for their brokerage business um, with a leading UK based copyright licensing firm that wanted to look at how they are going through the process of consumption data recording to royalty payments for copyright holders so that they are able to digitally redesign the operations to bring in efficiencies and cut costs with a leading chemical manufacturer in Germany to be able to digitize 
And did you imagine their entire insights platform to be able to be on top of the patenting process, uh, redefining customer experience for a telco um, and a couple of other such initiatives with a lot of UK and um, Europe-based customers as well. Um, here's an example of one of the case studies we did for uh, the patient support program. So we, we basically did patient interactions, we met caregivers, we met doctors, patient organizations, identified different pains, we made recommendations, 135 and count across these six different areas, created product backlog entries. So those 135 ideas across these six areas, um, we read the patient's mind and gave recommendations that mitigated some of these pains. Through this kind of a backlog entry, we drafted the ASSIS journey and then created the 2B journey eventually, which will be met by these backlog items. And um, it was a pretty collaborative process. So these are some of the examples of what we've done. Um, and in summary, I think what, what we believe is a critical success factor for any design thinking engagement to be successful is that it needs to be something that makes it fun for, for people involved. Um, it, it, it can get very strenuous when you're talking about, talk to me about your day in the life, talk to me about your journey, what pains do you encounter, what do you do, when do you do, why do you do, who do you do with, et cetera, et cetera. So it's important to make it fun. And it's important to prototype and experiment because once you get some of these ideas, you need to you know, quickly mesh up things and look at what it comes up to be. Uh, and important to challenge convention like the salmon, only when you actually challenge the current flow and go against the stream, will you spawn new life and new ideas? So it's important to challenge convention. And um, a lot of the times, unless you look beyond what's obvious, you wouldn't spot the risk of the opportunity lying there, like this leaf tail gecko that you have. And um, it's important to engage everybody involved here so that they're all part of the process and they feel collective. And that's key element of stakeholder engagement that you do. And it's very, very important to observe and listen and not be making more noise than needed so that you're able to observe and get the right kind of insights from the environment around you and the conversations going on around you. So these are some of the key takeaways and I'm kind of done with the presentation at the